violated his grandmother's corpse. Detectives believed him, however they couldn't charge him with anything because the fire had burned away any evidence. The only other question I had about this case was why no one ever addressed the fact that he was 16 years old, driving, but in the ninth grade. Part 2 Antonio Barbeau and Nathan Pop. Sheboygan, Wisconsin has always seemed a snapshot of Midwestern America, a picturesque community where residents were proud to raise their families and call themselves Sheboyganites. In late summer 2012, two 13-year-olds named Antonio Tino Barbeau and his friend Nathan Pop resided there and appeared to be typical American teens. On September 19th, just after one in the afternoon, Tino Barbeau's grandmother Judy Offit went to her mother's house to see why she hadn't kept their plans. She saw her mother's car wasn't in the garage and was relieved in thinking that she was out doing something else. However, as Judy turned to leave, she glanced toward the garage entrance to the house and spotted a blanket. Then, her mother's feet and blood. Broken-hearted, Judy makes the expected phone calls, speculating that her elderly mother had had some sort of accident. What Judy and other family members don't suspect at this time is that one of their own loved ones is responsible for this heinous crime. Judy's grandson, 13-year-old Tino Barbeau, was technically a runaway at that moment, an escapee from the county juvenile detention center. He was at his friend Nathan's house two days before Judy found her mother's body. Tino had brought with him a hatchet. Nathan said Tino told him that they should go to the home of his 78-year-old great-grandmother, Barbara Olson, to kill her and rob her for drug money. Nathan grabbed a hammer and had his mother unknowingly drop them near the house. She thought she was dropping them off in the West Wind Bluff subdivision to hang out with friends, but instead was transporting the teens with weapons hidden in their pants to commit a terrifying premeditated crime. Once in the clear, Tino and Nathan enter Barbara's home on West Ridge Drive uninvited. They make their entrance through an unlocked side door and almost immediately encounter Tino's great-grandmother, much to their dismay. According to Nathan, Barbara Olson told the boy she would call Tino's mother, Nikki Olson, to let her know that he was there. As she turns around to make the call, Nathan said that Tino hit his great-grandmother in the back of the head with the blunt side of the hatchet. She fell to the floor. Nathan stated that 78-year-old Barbara Olson was moaning, asking them to stop and holding her head. Tino struck her several more times while Nathan hit her with the hammer. Fond du Lac County Medical Examiner Doug Kelly would later testify that Barbara Olson sustained approximately 27 blows to the head. The final blow was delivered by Tino with the sharp side of the hatchet. It took the strength of both boys to pull it free. The house was then ransacked. Barbara's purse, loose change, and jewelry were all gathered up. The murder weapons were tossed into the trunk of Barbara's car parked in the garage. The teens made a futile attempt to drag Barbara's body to the car on a blanket. However, the children lacked the necessary strength, leaving her abandoned by the door where her daughter Judy would spot her two days later. 13-year-old 8th graders Tino Barbeau and Nathan Pop took off in Barbara's car, heading to the local bowling alley. The car was abandoned out back, unlocked, with jewelry lift plainly visible on the back seat and keys in the car. Bait left in hopes that the vehicle would be stolen and the murder attributed to other suspects. 
Security camera footage showed the two walking along a street, one of the pair casually swinging the victim's stolen purse before it was abandoned in a storm drain. The kids used the $155 they murdered for to buy pizza and marijuana. A quick trip to a convenience store was made and the boys were seen there on security camera footage purchasing cleaning wipes, which they used to try and clean up the car. Tino self-surrendered to the juvenile detention facility the next day, Tuesday, September 18th. Following the discovery of his great-grandmother's body, investigators got a warrant to search his locker there. Bloody shoes and clothing were found inside. Once Judy alerted authorities to her mother's accident, they had gone into action rapidly, especially due to the level of violence present at what turned out to be a crime scene. The neighborhood was canvassed, neighbors were questioned. One neighbor stated that when he returned home from picking up his daughter from school that Monday, he spotted Barbara Olson's gold Buick sedan speeding westbound down Westridge Drive. That took place a little after 4.30 p.m., two days earlier on September 17th. This was the same day that Tino was missing from the detention facility. The Buick was located through utilization of the OnStar system. On the floor of the front seat, police found schoolwork with the name Nate at the top. Barbara's purse was pulled from the storm drain, three houses down from Nate's house. The bloody wipes and some work gloves were pulled from bushes behind the bowling alley parking lot. Meanwhile, at Nathan Pop's house on South 13th Street, quarters, Barbara's gold watch, and bloody clothing and shoes were located. He provided officers with graphic details of the plan, murder, and aftermath. When Tino was confronted, he initially denied having any knowledge but it didn't take long for him to admit his involvement. He told police, however, that he and Nate had devised the plan together. Tino and Nate were arrested on Thursday and officially charged with Barbara Olson's murder on Friday, September 21, 2012, five days following the monstrous crime. The 13-year-olds were charged as adults with first-degree intentional homicide, making life sentences a possibility. Cash bond was set at $1 million each. The close-knit community was aghast. There hadn't been a murder in Sheboygan Falls since 1996, with the entirety of Sheboygan County averaging only one or two first-degree murders per year. Tino Barbeau initially pled not guilty by way of mental defect or disease. He had reportedly sustained a head injury after being struck by a car when he was riding his bike at the age of 10. Many who knew him said he was never the same following that head trauma. A mental competency hearing was ordered for Tino Barbeau, and he was ultimately ordered fit to stand trial. He and Nate would be tried together, but Tino ended up withdrawing his not guilty plea, instead pleading no contest. He would not be going to trial, but he would testify against his friend. This would not result in any reduction in his sentence. Nathan Pop's trial took place in June 2013. A testimony... Tino and Nate gave pretty different versions of events. Nate's defense lay in his claim that he didn't think that Tino was serious about killing his great-grandmother. Once there, he said he only went along because he was afraid Tino would turn and hit him too. After seeing his friend strike his own great-grandmother in the head with an axe, He testified that he was too frightened not to hit Barbara Olson twice with the hammer he had brought from home. Apparently, the boys had also brought with them masks to cover their faces, although they didn't use them. The jury had to view numerous gruesome crime scene and autopsy photos, depicting multiple cuts and fractures visible to the victim's head, face, hands, and arms. In the end, though, the jury determined that Nate shared blame with Tino for the murder, 
and he was found guilty of first-degree intentional homicide on June 30, 2013. On Monday, August 12, 2013, Antonio Barbeau was sentenced to life in prison with eligibility for parole in 36 years, at the age of 50. Tino entered the adult prison system at the age of 17 and is currently housed at Wampum Correctional Institution. In my 24 years on the bench, I've never seen anything of this nature, not even close, Circuit Court Judge Timothy Van Akron said at sentencing. It gives me great sadness to see someone of your age going into the system. The following day, August 13th, Nathan Pop was sentenced to life with eligibility for parole in 31 years at the age of 45. Nate also entered the adult prison system at the age of 17 and is currently housed at the Columbia Correctional Institution. Nate's family contended that he had the mental capacity of a 10-year-old and that made him susceptible to the peer pressure exerted by the more forceful and violent Tino Barbeau. Regardless, the jury did not believe that was a factor, nor did anyone entertain Tino's previous head trauma as a viable component either. Tino will become eligible for extended supervision beginning in 2048 and Nate in 2043. The first two of Antonio Barbeau's subsequent three appeals were denied in November 2013. Circuit Court Judge Timothy Van Akron did not agree that life with parole eligibility was unconstitutional for a juvenile, as the defense contended. Nor did the judge find that the abolishment of the state's parole system and its replacement with the extended supervision program warranted a new sentence. He simply amended it. An appeal was then filed with the Second District Court of Appeals, who upheld the circuit court decision in Tino's life sentence in June 2016. Like Tino's mother, Nikki Olson, said following Nate's guilty verdict at trial, everybody loses in this case. The whole situation is just sad for everyone. It's sad for the victim's family. It's sad for the boys and for Nate's family, too. As always, thanks for joining me for this episode 17. We now have a Patreon page and a coffee profile online if you'd like to donate to the show. For t-shirts, totes, and mugs, find us on Spreadshirt. If you're in the L.A. area or want to get yourself there, join us on October 6th for a true crime podcast meetup at Idle Hour Bar in North Hollywood. Murderous Miners, along with the Murderish Podcast, White Wine True Crime, The Cleaning of John Doe, The Pretty Scary Podcast, Crime with Rich Slayton and John Shevsky, and The Pros and Cons Podcast will be there to mingle with listeners. But the most exciting part is probably the special mystery guest. For true crime podcast lovers, this guest will knock your socks off. There will be celebrity guests in attendance, so keep checking back as we announce hints about the mystery guest and stay informed of other updates. All links are in the show notes and find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat at Killer Kids Pod. If you envision yourself behind the mic, visit ResonateRecordings.com today to have your first episode produced for free. They have the professionals, the expertise, and the experience to make your dream show a reality. Come back soon for another insomnia-inducing true account of the damage kids can inflict on murderous minors, killer kids. But until then, don't be scared. What's up, Home Trees? It's me, Chris. And Corey. And Donnie. From the More Gooder Than podcast. For each episode, the three of us pick a thematically similar movie. Like Dances with Wolves, The Last Samurai, and Avatar. Or Deep Impact, Armageddon, and Space Cowboys. And then duke it out until one movie is crowned most goodest. 
Three movies enter, one movie leaves. Ironically, Thunderdome was not the winner when we tackled the Mad Max trilogy. You know why, right? I... Oh, yeah.